From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, we bring you the women's session of the 189th Semiannual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Music for this session is provided by a choir of primary girls and young women from stakes in the West Jordan, Utah area. Women, young women, and girls eight years of age and above are gathered together throughout the world to receive counsel and instruction from church leaders. Joy D. Jones, Primary General President, will conduct this session. We welcome you to the women's session of the 189th semi-annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct. My name is Joy D. Jones, and I currently serve as Primary General President. We are grateful to be gathered in the conference center in Salt Lake City, Utah, and rejoice in knowing that there are similar gatherings in many meeting places throughout the world. We likewise welcome friends from other faiths who may be joining us and hope you enjoy our time together. We recognize in attendance this evening members of the First Presidency and members of the Priesthood and Family Executive Council. Also seated on the stand are those serving in the primary, young women, and Relief Society general presidencies, along with the general board members for each organization. The music for this session will be by a choir of primary girls and young women from the stakes in West Jordan, Utah, area under the direction of Casey Bradbury with Linda Margetts at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. The invocation will then be offered by Sister Salote Tukuafu, a member of the Primary General Board.
our Father who art in heaven. We come before thee at the opening of this General Women's Conference. We thank thee, Father, for a living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. We love and sustain him. We pray for those who will be speaking this evening that they will teach us truth and light. We pray for this beautiful choir as they sing songs of worship unto thee. Heavenly Father, may thy spirit stir our souls as we listen to the truth that will be taught this evening, that we will go home and be better sisters and women of the church. We dedicate this meeting unto thee, Father, and pray that we will always keep the commandments all the days of our lives, and we humbly say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We will now be pleased to hear from Sister Reina Isabel Alberto, who serves as second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. She will be followed by Sister Lisa Harkness, who serves as first counselor in the primary General Presidency. Sister Bonnie H. Corden, Young Women General President, will then address us. One of our beloved hymns expresses the plea, through cloud and sunshine, Lord, abide with me. I was once on a plane as it approached a large storm. Looking out the window, I could see a dense blanket of clouds below us. The rays of the setting sun reflected off the clouds, causing them to shine with intense brightness. Soon, the plane descended through the heavy clouds, and we were suddenly em enveloped in a thick darkness that completely blinded us to the intense light we had witnessed just moments earlier. Black clouds may also form in our lives, which can blind us to God's light and even cause us to question if that light exists for us anymore. Some of those clouds are of depression, anxiety, and other forms of mental and emotional affliction. They can distort the way we perceive all ourselves, others, and even God. They affect women and men of all ages in all corners of the world. Likewise damaging is the desensitizing cloud of skepticism that can affect others who have not experienced these challenges. Like any part of the body, the brain is subject to illnesses, trauma, and chemical imbalances. When our minds are suffering, it is appropriate to seek help from God, from those around us, and from medical and mental health professionals. All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents, and each has a divine nature and destiny. Like our heavenly parents and our Savior, we have a physical body and experience emotions. My dear sisters, it is normal to feel sad or worried once in a while. Sadness and anxiety are natural human emotions. However, if we are constantly sad and if our pain blocks our ability to feel the love of our Heavenly Father and His Son and the influence of the Holy Ghost, then we may be suffering from depression, anxiety, or another emotional condition. My daughter once wrote, there was a time when I was extremely sad all of the time. I always thought that sadness was something to be ashamed of and that it was a sign of weakness. So I kept my sadness to myself. I felt completely worthless. A friend described it this way. Since my early childhood, I had faced a constant battle with feelings of hopelessness, darkness, loneliness, and fear 
and the sense that I am broken or defective. I did everything to hide my pain and to never give the impression that I was anything but thriving and strong. My dear friends, it can happen to any of us, especially when, as believers in the plan of happiness, we place unnecessary burdens on ourselves by thinking we need to be perfect now. Such thoughts can be overwhelming. Achieving perfection is a process that will take place throughout our mortal life and beyond, and only through the grace of Jesus Christ. In contrast, when we open up about our emotional challenges, admitting we are not perfect, we give others permission to share their struggles. Together, we realize there is hope, and we do not have to suffer alone. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we have made a covenant with God that we are willing to bear one another's burdens and to mourn with those that mourn. This may include becoming informed about emotional illnesses, finding resources that are, can help address these struggles, and ultimately, bringing ourselves and others to Christ, who is the master healer. Even if we do not know how to relate to what others are going through, validating that their pain is real can be an important first step in finding understanding and healing. In some cases, the cause of depression or anxiety can be identified, while other times it may be harder to discern. Our brains may suffer because of stress or staggering fatigue, which can sometimes be improved through adjustments in diet, sleep, and exercise. Other times, therapy or medication under the direction of trained professionals may also be needed. And treated mental or emotional illness can lead to increased isolation, misunderstandings, broken relationships, self-harm, and even suicide. I know this firsthand. As my own father died of, died of suicide many years ago, his death was shocking and heartbreaking for me, for my family and me. It has taken me years to work through my grief. And it was only recently that I learned talking about suicide in appropriate ways actually helps to prevent it rather than encourage it. I have now openly discussed my father's death with my children and witnessed the healing that the Savior can give on both sides of the veil. Sadly, many who suffer from severe depression distance themselves from their fellow saints because they feel they do not fit some imaginary mold. We can help them know and feel that they do indeed belong with us. It is important to recognize that depression is not the result of weakness, nor is it usually the result of sin. It thrives in secrecy, but shrinks in empathy. Together, we can break through the clouds of isolation and stigma so the burden of shame is lifted and miracles of healing can occur. During his mortal ministry, Jesus Christ healed the sick and the afflicted, but each person had to exercise faith in him and act to receive his healing. Some walked for long distances, others extended their hand to touch his garment, and others had to be carried to him in order to be healed. When it comes to healing, don't we all need him desperately? Are we not all beggars? Let us follow the Savior's path and increase our compassion, diminish our tendency to judge, and stop being the inspectors of the spirituality of others. Listening with love is one of the greatest gifts we can offer, and we may be able to help carry or lift the heavy clouds that suffocate our loved ones and friends, so that through our love, they can once again feel the Holy Ghost and perceive the light 
that emanates from Jesus Christ. If you are constantly surrounded by a mist of darkness, turn to Heavenly Father. Nothing that you have experienced can change the eternal truth that you are His child and that He loves you. Remember that Christ is your Savior and Redeemer, and God is your Father. They understand. Picture them close by you, listening and offering support. They will console you in your afflictions. Do all you can and trust in the Lord's atoning grace. Your struggles do not define you, but they can refine you. Because of a thorn in the flesh, you may have the ability to feel more compassion toward others. As guided by the Holy Ghost, share your story in order to succor the weak. Lift up the hands which hand down and strengthen the feeble knees. For those of us currently struggling or supporting someone who is struggling, let us be willing to follow God's commandments so we may always have His Spirit with us. Let us do the small and simple things that will give us spiritual strength. As President Russell M. Nelson said, nothing opens the heavens quite like the combination of increased purity, exact obedience, earnest seeking, daily feasting on the words of Christ in the Book of Mormon, and regular time committed to temple and family history work. Let us all remember that our Savior Jesus Christ has taken upon him our infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know how to succor us according to our infirmities. He came to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort all that mourn, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I testify to you that through cloud and sunshine, the Lord will abide with us. Our afflictions can be swallowed up in the joy of Christ, and it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. I testify that Jesus Christ will return to the earth with healing in his wings. Ultimately, he shall wipe away all tears from our eyes, and there shall be no more sorrow. For all who will come unto Christ and be perfected in him, the sun shall no more go down, for the Lord shall be our everlasting light, and the days of our mourning shall be ended. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As parents excitedly await the birth of a child, they have the responsibility of choosing a name for their new baby. Perhaps when you were born, you received a name that was passed down in your family for generations. Or maybe the name you were given was popular in the year or area in which you were born. The prophet Helaman and his wife gave meaningful family names to their infant sons Nephi and Lehi. Helaman told his sons, I have given unto you the names of our first parents, that when you remember your names, ye may remember them. And when ye remember them, ye may remember their works that it is said and also written that they were good. Therefore, my sons, I would that ye should do that which is good. Nephi's and Lehi's names help them remember the good works of their ancestors and encourage them to do good as well. Sisters, no matter where we live, what language we speak, or whether we are eight years old or 108, we all share a special name that has these same purposes. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we first pledged our willingness to take upon us the name of Christ by the ordinance of baptism. Through this covenant, we promise to always remember Him, keep His commandments, and serve others. Our willingness to keep this covenant is renewed each Sabbath day 
when we partake of the sacrament and rejoice once again in the blessing of walking in newness of life. The name we were given at birth reflects our individual identity and gives us belonging within our earthly families. However, when we were born again at baptism, our understanding of who we are was enlarged. Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ. For behold, he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, ye are born of him. Thus, with covenant identity and belonging, we are called by the name of Jesus Christ, and there is no other name given, nor any other way, nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. The name of Jesus was known long before his birth. To King Benjamin, an angel prophesied, and he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and his mother shall be called Mary. His work of redeeming love was also made known to God's children whenever the gospel has been on the earth, from the days of Adam and Eve until our present day, so they could know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Last year, President Russell M. Nelson extended a prophetic plea to the sisters to shape the future by helping to gather scattered Israel. He invited us to read the Book of Mormon and mark each verse that speaks of or refers to the Savior. He asked that we be intentional about talking of Christ, rejoicing in Christ, and preaching of Christ with our family and friends. Perhaps you have begun to recognize the fruits of His promise that you and they will be drawn closer to the Savior and changes, even miracles, will begin to happen. Our promise to always remember the Savior gives us strength to stand for truth and righteousness, whether we are in a large crowd or in our solitary places where no one knows our actions except for God. When we remember Him and His name we bear, we have no place for self-degrading comparisons or overbearing judgments. With our eyes on the Savior, we see ourselves for who we really are, a cherished child of God. Our covenant remembering quiets worldly worries, turns self-doubt into courage, and gives hope in times of trial. And when we stumble and fall in our progression along the covenant path, we have only to remember His name and His loving kindness towards us, for He has all wisdom, all power, and all understanding. He comprehendeth all things, and He is a merciful being to those who will repent and believe on His name. Surely there is no sweeter sound than the name of Jesus to all those who with a broken heart and a contrite spirit seek to do better and be better. President Nelson taught, the day is gone when you can be a quiet and comfortable Christian. Your religion is not just about showing up for church on Sunday, it is about showing up as a true disciple from Sunday morning through Saturday night. There is no such thing as a part-time disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our willingness to take upon us the name of Christ is more than a formal exchange of words. It is not a passive promise or a cultural contrivance. It is not a rite of passage or a name tag that we wear. It is not a saying that we simply place on a shelf or hang on a wall. His is a name that is put on, written in our hearts, and engraven upon our countenances. The Savior's atoning sacrifice should be remembered always through our thoughts, actions, and interactions with others. Not only does He remember our names, but He remembers us 
always. The Savior declared, For can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee, O house of Israel? Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. President George Albert Smith taught, Honor the names that you bear, because someday you will have the privilege and the obligation of reporting to your Father in Heaven what you have done with those names. Like the carefully chosen names of Nephi and Lehi, can it be said and written of us that we are true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we honor the name of Jesus Christ that we have willingly taken upon ourselves? Are we both a minister and a witness of His loving kindness and His redeeming power? Not long ago, I was listening to the Book of Mormon. In the last chapter of 2 Nephi, I heard Nephi say something that I had never read the same way before. All throughout his record, he teaches and testifies of the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the Lamb of God, and the Messiah. But as he closed his account, I heard him say these words, I glory in plainness, I glory in truth, I glory in my Jesus, for he hath redeemed my soul. When I heard these words, my heart rejoiced, and I had to listen over and over again. I recognized and responded to that verse just like I recognize and respond to my own name. The Lord has said, Yea, blessed is this people who are willing to bear my name, for in my name shall they be called, and they are mine. As members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, may we gladly take upon us the name of Christ by honoring His name with love, devotion, and good works. I testify that He is the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. In the name of His Holy Child, Jesus Christ, amen. My dear sisters, it is a joy to be with you. We are witnessing an outpouring of revelation that is both soul-stretching and exhilarating. As we begin, I would like to introduce you to some friends. They are young women, unique in talent, custom, and individual and family circumstance. Each of them, like all of you have captured my heart. First, meet Bella. She stands strong as the only young woman in her branch in Iceland. Meet devoted Josephine from Africa, who has recommitted to studying the Book of Mormon every day. She's discovering the power and the blessings that come from this simple, faithful act. And finally, meet my dear friend Ashton, an extraordinary young woman who passed away after a six-year battle with cancer. Her testimony, her strong testimony of the Atonement of Jesus Christ still echoes in my heart. You are all remarkable young women. You are unique, each with your own gifts and experiences, yet alike in a very important and eternal way. You are literally the spirit daughters of heavenly parents, and nothing can separate you from their love and the love of your Savior. As you draw closer to Him, even taking the smallest baby steps forward, you will discover the lasting peace that settles into your soul as a faithful disciple 
of our Savior, Jesus Christ. President Russell M. Nelson, our dearly beloved prophet, has asked that I share some inspired changes that will help you develop your sacred personal potential and increase your righteous influence. I will address four areas of adjustments tonight. First, at the heart of all we do in Young Women is our desire to help you gain unshakable faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a sure knowledge of your divine identity as a daughter of God. Tonight, I would like to announce a revision to the Young Women theme. I pray you will feel the Holy Ghost testify the truth of these words as I say the new theme. I am a beloved daughter of heavenly parents with a divine nature and eternal destiny. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, I strive to become like him. I seek and act upon personal revelation and minister to others in his holy name. I will stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places. As I strive to qualify for exaltation, I cherish the gift of repentance and seek to improve each day. With faith, I will strengthen my home and family, make and keep sacred covenants, and receive the ordinances and blessings of the Holy Temple. Notice the shift from we to I. These truths apply to you individually. You are beloved daughters of heavenly parents. You are a covenant disciple of Jesus Christ. I invite you to exercise your faith and study and ponder these words. I know as you do, you will gain a testimony of their truthfulness. Understanding these truths will change the way you face challenges. Knowing your identity and purpose will help you align your will with the Savior's. Peace and guidance will be yours as you follow Jesus Christ. The second area of change affects young women classes. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, so often what people need so much is to be sheltered from the storms of life in the sanctuary of belonging. Our classes must be sanctuaries from the storms, secure, secure places of love and belonging. In an effort to build greater unity, strengthen friendships, and increase that feeling of belonging within young women, we are making some adjustments to class structure. Did you know for over 100 years, young women have been divided into three classes? Beginning immediately, we invite young women leaders and bishops to prayerfully consider the needs of each young woman and organize them according to the ward's specific circumstances. Now here are some examples of how this might look. If you have a few young women, you could have one young woman class with everyone meeting together. Perhaps you have a large group of young women age 12, and then a small group of young women who are older. You may decide to have two classes, young women 12 and young women 13 through 18. Or you have a large ward with 60 young women attending. You may have six classes, one with each age organized by year. However your classes are organized, you young women are vital in building unity. Be a light to those around you. Be the source of love and care you are hoping to receive from others. With a prayer in your heart, continue to reach out and be that force for good. As you do so, your life will be filled with kindness. You will have a better feeling towards others and will begin to say their goodness in return. Third, with this new class organization, all classes, 
will be referred to by the unifying name of young women. We will retire the names we have so loved, Beehive, My Maid, and Laurel. The final area I wish to address is the importance of class presidencies. No matter how young women classes are organized, every class should have a class presidency. It is by divine design that young women are called to lead in their youth. The role and purpose of class presidencies has been strengthened and more clearly defined. The work of salvation is one of these significant responsibilities, particularly in the areas of ministering, missionary work, activation, and temple and family history work. Yes, this is how we gather Israel, a glorious work for all young women as members of the Lord's Youth Battalion. As you know, at every level of the church, the Lord calls presidencies to lead us people. Young women, being a member of a class presidency may be your first opportunity to participate in this inspired pattern of leadership. Adult leaders, this is for you, make the calling of class presidencies a priority and then lead side by side with them, mentoring and guiding them so that they can succeed. Whatever level of leadership experience a class presidency has, start where they are and help them develop the skills and confidence that will bless them as leaders. Stay close to them, but don't take over. The Spirit will guide you as you guide them. To illustrate the vital role of parents and leaders as mentors, let me tell you a story. Chloe was called to serve as a class president. Her wise priesthood leader encouraged her to seek the Lord's help in recommending names for her presidency. Chloe prayed and received inspiration for whom to recommend as her counselors rather quickly. As she continued to ponder and pray about a secretary, the Spirit repeatedly drew her focus to a young woman that surprised her someone who rarely came to church or activities. Feeling a little insecure with the prompting, Chloe talked with her mother, who explained that one of the ways we can receive revelation is through reoccurring thoughts. With renewed confidence, Chloe felt she could recommend this young woman. The bishop extended the call and the young woman accepted. After being set apart, this sweet secretary said, You know, I never felt as though I had a place or was needed anywhere. I didn't feel I fit in. But with this calling, I feel as though Heavenly Father has a purpose and a place for me. As Chloe and her mother left the meeting, Chloe turned to her mother and said with tears in her eyes, Revelation is real. Revelation really works. Class presidencies, you have been called of God and trusted to lead a group of his daughters. The Lord knows you. He chose you. You have been set apart by one who has priesthood authority. This means as you perform the duties of your calling, you exercise priesthood authority. You have an important work to do. Be sensitive to and act on the promptings of the Holy Ghost. As you do so, you can serve with confidence, for you do not serve alone. Class presidents, we need your wisdom, voice, and energy in the new Ward Youth Council that Elder Quinton L. Cook announced today. You are an essential part of the solution to the meeting the needs of your brothers and sisters. These changes in class organization and leadership may begin as soon as wards and branches are ready, but should be in place by January 1st, 2020. My dear sisters, I bear witness 
that these adjustments I've spoken of today are inspired direction from the Lord. As we diligently implement these adjustments, may we never lose sight of our purpose to strengthen our resolve to follow Jesus Christ and help others come unto Him. I testify that this is His church. How grateful I am that He allows us to be a very important part of this sacred work. I pray that the same Spirit that has guided these adjustments will guide you as you press forward on the covenant path. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing, We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from President Henry B. Eyring and President Dallin H. Oaks. I am grateful for the blessing of addressing you, the covenant daughters of God. Tonight, my purpose is to encourage you in the great service to which you are called. Yes, every daughter of God listening to my voice has received a call from the Lord Jesus Christ. Your call began when you were placed into mortality, in a place and time chosen for you by a God who knows you perfectly and loves you as his daughter. In the spirit world, he knew you and taught you and placed where you would have the opportunity, rare in the history of the world, to be invited into a baptismal font. There, 
you would hear these words spoken by a called servant of Jesus Christ. Open quote. Having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Close quote. When you came up out of the water, you had accepted another call to serve. As a new covenant daughter of God, you made a promise and received an assignment in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of which you were confirmed a member. You coveted with God to take upon yourself the name of Jesus Christ, to keep his commandments and to serve him. For each one who makes these covenants, the service that the Lord calls him or her to do will be suited perfectly to that person. The covenant daughters and sons of God, however, all share one important and joyful call. It is to serve others for him. Speaking to sisters, President Russell M. Nelson gave a wonderful summary of the Lord's call to you to join him in his work. President Nelson described your call in this way. Quote, the Lord said, my work and my glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. So his devoted daughter disciple may truly say, my work and my glory is to help my loved ones reach that heavenly goal, close quote. He went on, to help another human being reach one's essential potential is part of the divine mission of woman. As mother, teacher, or nurturing saint, she molds living clay to the shape of her hopes. In partnership with God, her divine mission is to help spirits live and souls be lifted. This is the measure of her creation. It is ennobling, edifying, and exalting." Close quote. Now, you cannot know when or for what length of time your personal mission will be focused on service in calls such as mother, leader, or ministering sister. The Lord, out of love, does not leave us the choice of the timing, duration, or sequence of our assignments. Yet you know from Scripture and living prophets that all of these assignments will come either in this life or in the next to every daughter of God. And all of them are preparation for eternal life in loving families, the greatest of all the gifts of God. You will be wise to bend every effort to prepare now with the end in mind. That task is made simpler because each of these assignments require much of the same preparation. Let's start with the assignment to be a ministering sister. Whether you have that assignment as a 10-year-old daughter in a family where the father has died, or as a Relief Society president whose town has recently been affected by fire, or when you were in a hospital recovering from surgery, you have a chance to fulfill your call from the Lord to be his ministering daughter. Those appear to be very different ministering assignments, yet they all require the preparation of a powerful, loving heart, a fearless faith that the Lord gives no command, save he prepares a way, and a desire to go and do for him. Because she was prepared, the 10-year-old daughter put her arms around her widowed mother and prayed to know how to help her family. And she 
keeps at it. The Relief Society president had prepared to minister before the unexpected fire in her area. She had come to know the lo and love the people. Her faith in Jesus Christ had grown over the years from having received answers to her prayers for the Lord to help her in small services for him. Because of her long preparation, she was ready and eager to organize her sisters to minister to people and families in distress. A sister recovering in a hospital from surgery was prepared to minister to her fellow patients. She had spent a lifetime ministering for the Lord to every stranger as if he or she was a neighbor and a friend. When she felt in her heart the call to minister in the hospital, she served others so bravely and much love that the other patients began to hope she would never recover, or at least not soon. <laughs> in the same way that you prepare to minister, you can and must prepare for your call to be a leader for the Lord when it comes. When it comes, it will require faith in Jesus Christ rooted in your deep love of the scriptures to lead people and to teach his word without fear. Then you will be prepared to have the Holy Ghost as your constant companion. You will be eager to say, I will, when your counselor in the Young Women Presidency says with panic in her voice, Sister Alvarez is sick today, who will teach her class? It takes much the same preparation for the wonderful day when the Lord calls you to an assignment as a mother. But it will also take even more loving heart than you needed earlier. It will take faith in Jesus Christ beyond what has ever been in your heart. And it will take a capacity to pray for the influence, direction, and comfort of the Holy Ghost beyond what you may have felt was even possible. Now you might reasonably ask, I can just hear you thinking, how a man of any age can know what mothers need. <laughs> it's a valid question. <laughs> Men can know everything, but we can learn from lessons by revelation from God, and we can also learn much by observation when we take the opportunity to seek the Spirit to help us understand what we observe. I have been observing Kathleen Johnson Iring for 57 years that we've been married. She is the mother of four boys and two girls. To date, she has accepted the call to be a mothering influence on more than 100 direct family members and hundreds more whom she has adopted in her mother heart. You remember President Nelson's perfect descriptions of a woman's divine mission including her mission of mothering. Open quote, as mother, teacher, or nurturing saint, she molds living clay to the shape of her hopes. In partnership with God, her defined mission is to help spirits live and souls be lifted. This is the measure of her creation. As nearly as I can discern, my wife Kathleen has followed that charge given to our father's daughters. The key appears to be the words, quote, she molds living clay to the shape of her hopes in partnership with God. Kathy did not force, she molded, and she had a template for her hopes to which she tried to mold those she left and mothered. Her template was the gospel of Jesus Christ, as I could see through prayerful observation over the years. Becoming a covenant woman in partnership with God is how great and good daughters have always mothered, led, ministered, served in whatever the place he has called them and prepared them for. I promise you that you will find joy in your journey to your heavenly home as you return to him as a covenant-keeping daughter of God. I testify that God the Father lives 
and he loves you. His beloved son leads in every detail the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson is his living prophet, and Joseph Smith saw and spoke with God the Father and Jesus Christ in a grove of trees in Palmyra, New York. I know that is true. I also testify that he will answer your prayers. Your Heavenly Father loves you. Jesus Christ is your Savior, loves you, and through his atonement, you can be purified and lifted to the high and holy callings which will come to you. I so testify in the name, the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My dear sisters in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I greet you as divinely assigned guardians of the eternal family. President Russell M. Nelson has taught us Quote, this church was restored so that families could be formed, sealed, and exalted eternally, end of quote. That teaching has important implications for persons who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, commonly referred to as LGBT. President Nelson has also reminded us that we don't have to always agree with each other to love each other. These prophetic teachings are important for family discussions to answer the questions of children and youth. I have prayerfully sought inspiration to speak to this audience because you are uniquely affected by these questions which directly or indirectly affect every family in the Church. I begin with what Jesus taught were the two great commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. End of quote. This means we are commanded to love everyone. Since Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan teaches that everyone is our neighbor. But our zeal to keep this second commandment must not cause us to forget the first, to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. We show that love by keeping his commandments. God requires us to obey his commandments because only through that obedience, including repentance, can we return to live in his presence and become perfect as he is. In his recent talk to the young adults of the church, President Russell M. Nelson spoke of what he called the, quote, strong connection between God's love and his laws, end of quote. The law that applies most significantly to the issues relating to those identifying as LGBT is God's love, law of marriage and its companion law of chastity. Both are essential in our Father in Heaven's plan of salvation for his children. As President Nelson taught, God's laws are motivated entirely by his infinite love for us and his desire for us to become all we can become. President Nelson taught, many countries have legalized same-sex marriage. As members of the church, we respect the laws of the land, including civil marriage. The truth is, however, that in the beginning, marriage was ordained by God. And to this day, it is defined by him as being between a man and a woman. God has not changed his definition of marriage. 
President Nelson continued, God has also not changed the law of chastity. Requirements to enter the temple have not changed, end of quote. President Nelson reminded all of us that our commission as apostles is to teach nothing but truth. That commission does not give apostles the authority to modify divine law, end of quote. Thus, my sisters, the leaders of the church must always teach the unique importance of marriage between a man and a woman and the related law of chastity. The work of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is ultimately concerned with preparing the children of God for the celestial kingdom, and most particularly for its highest glory, exaltation, or eternal life. That highest destiny is only possible through marriage for eternity. Eternal life includes the creative powers inherent in the combination of male and female, what modern revelation describes as the continuation of the seeds forever and ever. In his BYU talk, President Nelson taught Quote, abiding by God's laws will keep you safe as you progress toward eventual exaltation, end of quote. That is to become like God with the exalted life and divine potential of our heavenly parents. That is the destiny we desire for all we love. Because of that love, we cannot let our love supersede the commandments and the plan and work of God, which we know will bring those we love their greatest happiness. But there are many we love, including some who have the restored gospel, who do not believe in or choose not to follow God's commandments about marriage and the law of chastity. What about them? God's doctrine shows that all of us are His children and that He has created us to have joy. Modern revelation teaches that God has provided a plan for a mortal experience in which all can choose obedience to seek His highest blessings or make choices that lead to one of the less glorious kingdoms. Because of God's great love for all of His children, those lesser kingdoms are still more wonderful than mortals can comprehend. The Atonement of Jesus Christ makes all of this possible as He, quote, glorifies the Father and saves all the works of His hands, end of quote. I've spoken of the first commandment, but what of the second? How do we keep the commandment to love our neighbors? We seek to persuade our members that those who follow lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender teachings and actions should be treated with the love our Savior commands us to show toward all our neighbors. Thus, when same-sex marriage was declared legal, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve declared, quote, The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us to love and treat all people with kindness and civility, even when we disagree. We affirm that those who avail themselves of laws or court rulings authorizing same-sex marriage should not be treated disrespectfully. End of quote. Further, we must never persecute those who do not share our beliefs and commitments. Regretfully, some persons facing these issues continue to feel marginalized and rejected by some members and leaders in our families, wards, and stakes. We must all strive to be kinder and more civil. For reasons we do not understand, we have different challenges in our mortal experiences. 
But we do know that God will help each of us overcome these challenges if we sincerely seek his help. After suffering and repenting for violations of laws we have been taught, we are all destined for a kingdom of glory. The ultimate and final judgment will be by the Lord, who alone has the required knowledge, wisdom, and grace to judge each of us. Meanwhile, we must try to keep both of the great commandments. To do so, we walk a fine line between law and love, keeping the commandments and walking the covenant path while loving our neighbors along the way. This walk requires us to seek divine inspiration on what to support and what to oppose and how to love and listen respectfully and teach in the process. Our walk demands that we not compromise on commandments, but show forth a full measure of understanding and love. Our walk must be considerate of children who are uncertain about their sexual orientation, but it discourages premature labeling because in most children, such uncertainty decreases significantly over time. Our walk opposes recruitment away from the covenant path, and it denies support to any who lead people away from the Lord. In all of this, we remember that God promises hope and ultimate joy and blessings for all who keep his commandments. Mothers and fathers and all of us are responsible to teach both of the two great commandments. For the women of the church, President Spencer W. Kimball described that duty in this great prophecy, quote, much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different from the women of the world. Thus, it will be that female exemplars of the church will be a significant force in both the numerical and the spiritual growth of the church in the last days." End of quote. Speaking of that prophecy, President Russell M. Nelson declared that the day that President Kimball foresaw is today. You are the women he foresaw. Little did we who heard that prophecy 40 years ago realize that among those the women of this church may save will be their own dear friends and family who are currently influenced by worldly priorities and devilish distortions. My prayer and blessing is that you will teach and act to fulfill that prophecy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dear sisters, we express sincere appreciation to each one of you for sharing this evening with us. We thank the choir and all others for their participation and gratefully acknowledge those who have assisted in preparing for this meeting in any way. The choir will now favor us with, I love to see the temple. Our concluding speaker will then be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, He Sent His Son. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Carol Costley, a member of the Young Women General Board.
Thank you for that beautiful music. As we all stood to sing that intermediate hymn, we thank thee, O God, for our prophet. I had two overpowering thoughts come to me. One is about the prophet Joseph Smith, the prophet of this dispensation. My love and admiration for him grows with every passing day. And the second thought occurred as I looked at my wife, my daughters, granddaughters, great-granddaughters. I felt like I'd like to claim every one of you as part of my family. <laughs> so if you're looking for an extra grandpa, <laughs> give me a call. Several months ago, at the, big, at the end of a temple endowment session, I said to my wife, Wendy, I hope the sisters understand the spiritual treasures that are theirs in the temple. Sisters, I often find myself thinking about you, including two months ago when Wendy and I visited Harmony, Pennsylvania. This was our second trip there. Both times, we have been deeply moved as we walked on that sacred ground. It was in harmony that John the Baptist appeared to Joseph Smith and restored the Aaronic priesthood. It was there that the apostles Peter, James, and John appeared to restore the Melchizedek priesthood. It was in harmony that Emma Hale Smith served as her husband's first scribe while the prophet translated the Book of Mormon. It was also in harmony that Joseph received a revelation manifesting the Lord's will to Emma. The Lord instructed Emma to expound the scriptures, to exhort the church, to receive the Holy Ghost, and to spend her time learning much. Emma was also counseled to lay aside the things of this world and seek for the things of a better, and to hold fast to her covenants with God. The Lord concluded his instruction with these compelling words, This is my voice unto all. Everything that happened in harmony has profound implications for your lives. The restoration of the priesthood, along with the Lord's counsel to Emma, can guide and bless each of you. How I yearn for you to understand that the restoration of the priesthood is just as relevant to you as a woman as it is to any man. Because the Melchizedek priesthood has been restored, both covenant-keeping women and men have access to all the spiritual blessings of the Church. Or we might say, to all the spiritual treasures the Lord has for His children. Every woman and every man who makes covenants with God and keeps those covenants, and who participates worthily in priesthood ordinances, has direct access to the power of God. Those who are endowed in the house of the Lord received a gift of God's priesthood power by virtue of their covenant, along with a gift of knowledge to know how to draw upon that power. The heavens are just as open to women who are endowed with God's power, that power flowing from their priesthood covenants, as there are to men who bear the priesthood. I pray that truth will register upon each of your hearts, because I believe it will change your life. Sisters, dear sisters, you have the right to draw liberally upon the Savior's power to help your family and others you love. Now you might be saying to yourself, this sounds wonderful, but how do I do it? How do I draw the Savior's power into my life? 
You won't find this process spelled out in any manual. The Holy Ghost will be your personal tutor as you seek to understand what the Lord would have you know and do. This process is neither quick nor easy, but it is spiritually invigorating. What could possibly be more exciting than to labor with the Spirit to understand God's power, priesthood power? What I can tell you is that accessing the power of God in your life requires the same things that the Lord instructed Emma and each of you to do. So, I invite you to study prayerfully Section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants and discover what the Holy Ghost will teach you. Your personal spiritual endeavor will bring you joy as you gain, understand, and use the power with which you have been endowed. Part of this endeavor will require you to put aside many things of this world. Sometimes we speak almost casually about walking away from the world with its contention, pervasive temptations, and false philosophies. But truly doing so requires you to examine your life meticulously and regularly. As you do so, the Holy Ghost will prompt you about what is no longer needful, what is no longer worthy of your time and energy. As you shift your focus away from worldly distractions, some things that seem important to you now will recede in priority. You will need to say no to some things, even though they may seem harmless. As you embark upon and continue this lifelong process of consecrating your life to the Lord, the changes in your perspective, feelings, and spiritual strength will amaze you. Now, a little word of warning. There are those who would undermine your ability to call upon the power of God. There are some who would have you doubt yourself and minimize your stellar spiritual capacity as a righteous woman. Most certainly, the adversary does not want you to understand the covenant you made at baptism or the profound endowment of knowledge and power you have received or will receive in the temple, the house of the Lord. And Satan certainly does not want you to understand that every time you worthily serve and worship in the temple, you leave armed with God's power and with his angels having charge over you. Satan and his minions will constantly contrive roadblocks to prevent you from understanding the spiritual gifts with which you have been and can be blessed. Unfortunately, some roadblocks may be the result of another's misbehavior. It grieves me to think that any of you have felt marginalized or have not been believed by a priesthood leader or have been abused or betrayed by a husband, father, or a supposed friend. I feel deep sorrow that any of you have felt sidelined, disrespected, or misjudged. Such offenses have no place in the kingdom of God. Conversely, it thrills me when I learn of priesthood leaders that eagerly seek the participation of women in ward and state councils. I am inspired by each husband who demonstrates that his most important priesthood responsibility is to care for his wife. I praise that man who deeply respects his wife's ability to receive revelation and tr he treasures her as an equal partner in their marriage. 
When a man understands the majesty and power of a righteous, seeking, endowed Latter-day Saint woman, is it any wonder that he feels like standing when she enters the room? From the dawning of time, women have been blessed with a unique moral compass, the ability to distinguish right from wrong. This gift is enhanced in those who make and keep covenants, and it diminishes in those who willfully ignore the commandments of God. I hasten to add that I do not absolve men in any way from God's requirement for them also to distinguish between right and wrong. But my dear sisters, your ability to discern truth from error to be society's guardians of morality is crucial in these latter days. As we depend upon you to teach others to do likewise, let me be very clear about this. If the world loses the moral rectitude of its women, the world will never recover. We Latter-day Saints are not all of the world. We are of covenant Israel. We are called to prepare a people for the second coming of the Lord. Now, may I clarify several additional points with respect to women and priesthood. When you are set apart to serve in a calling under the direction of one who holds priesthood keys, such as your bishop or stake president, you are given priesthood authority to function in that calling. Similarly, in the Holy Temple, you are authorized to perform and officiate in priesthood ordinances every time you attend. Your temple endowment prepares you to do so. If you are endowed but not currently married to a man who bears the priesthood, and someone says to you, I'm sorry you don't have the priesthood in your home. Please understand that statement is incorrect. You may not have a priesthood bearer in your home, but you have received and made sacred covenants with God in His temple. From those covenants flows an endowment of His priesthood power upon you. And remember, if your husband should die, you would preside in your home. As a righteous, endowed Latter-day Saint woman, you speak and teach with power and authority from God. Whether by exhortation or conversation, we need your voice teaching the doctrine of Christ. We need your input in family, ward, and state councils. Your participation is essential and never ornamental. My dear sisters, your power will increase as you serve others. Your prayers, fasting, time in the scriptures, service in the temple, family history work will open the heavens to you. I entreat you to study prayerfully all the truths you can find about priesthood power. You might begin with Doctrine and Covenants sections 84 and 107. Those sections will lead you to other passages. The scriptures and teachings by modern prophets, seers, and revelators are filled with these truths. As your understanding increases and as you exercise faith in the Lord's priesthood power and the Lord Himself, your ability to draw upon this spiritual treasure that the Lord has made available will increase. As you do so, you will find yourselves better able to help create eternal families that are united, sealed in the temple of the Lord, and full of love for our Heavenly Father and for Jesus Christ. All our efforts to minister to each other, proclaim the gospel, perfect the saints, and redeem the dead, they all converge in the holy temple. 
We now have 166 temples throughout the world, and more are coming. As you know, the Salt Lake Temple, Temple Square, and the adjoining plaza near the church office building will be renewed in a project that will begin at the close of this year. This sacred temple must be preserved and prepared to inspire future generations just as it has influenced us in this generation. As the church grows, more temples will be built so that more families can have access to that greatest of all blessings, that of eternal life. We regard a temple as the most sacred structure in the church. Whenever plans are announced to construct a new temple, it becomes an important part of our history. As we have discussed here tonight, you sisters are vital to the work of the temple, and the temple is where you will receive your highest spiritual treasures. Please listen carefully and reverently as I will now announce plans to build eight new temples. If one is announced in a place that is meaningful to you, I suggest that you simply bow your head prayerfully with gratitude in your heart. We are pleased to announce plans to construct temples in the following locations. Freetown, Sierra Leone, Orem, Utah, Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, Bentonville, Arkansas, Bacolod, Philippines, McAllen, Texas, Coban, Guatemala, Taylorsville, Utah. Thank you, dear sisters. We deeply ag appreciate your receipt of these plans and your reverent response. Now, in closing, I would like to leave a blessing upon you that you may understand the priesthood power with which you have been endowed and that you will augment that power by exercising your faith in the Lord and in His power. Dear sisters, with deep respect and gratitude, I express my love for you. Humbly, I declare that God lives. Jesus is the Christ. This is His Church. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, we humbly bow our heads before thee this day to express our gratitude for the spirit that has been with us. Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the knowledge of our divine nature and for the ability that we have to tap into thy power. We pray, Father, that as we leave this day, that these truths might be embedded upon our hearts and that we might live with determination to understand thy will for us as we come to understand these truths and to have faith in them for our individual selves. We are so very grateful for our prophet, President Nelson, and for the apostles and those general officers who have spoken to us this day. We are so very grateful for the words that have been shared with us and we pray that we might move forward with a deeper commitment to live like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we say these things in the name of thy beloved Lord, name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen.